This is Blackbird, a wind-powered vehicle with no motors, no batteries, no twisted rubber bands. It has no internal means of propulsion. It just moves due to the wind. In this video, Blackbird is just beginning to move from left to right, and you can see from the anemometer and wind vane that the wind is blowing to the right. So of course that makes sense. The wind is pushing Blackbird to the right. But the counterintuitive result is that Blackbird can actually reach and maintain speeds that are greater than the speed of the wind. In fact, in tests, Blackbird has reached speeds nearly three times wind speed. In a moment, you'll see that the wind vane, which is mounted on top of a vehicle that's moving beside Blackbird, will change direction. At that point, the air, relative to Blackbird, will be moving from right to left. So how does Blackbird continue to move to the right? What sparked my interest in Blackbird was a recent pair of videos by Derek Muller of Veritasium. In fact, you can poke around the internet and find lots of earlier videos and articles about Blackbird. Apparently, the concept of a wind-powered vehicle that can travel downwind faster than wind speed has been quite controversial. A lot of people argued that faster than wind travel is impossible, while others argued that it should be possible. Unfortunately, their arguments tend to get tangled up in lots of complex details involving the hydrodynamics of airfoils and power transfer mechanisms. And these arguments tend to be presented in just words, with little or no mathematical analysis to support them. What I plan to do in this video is carry out a straightforward analysis of Blackbird using Newtonian physics. The analysis shows what has already been demonstrated experimentally. Travel downwind at speeds faster than wind speed is indeed possible. So what is Blackbird? Well, Blackbird has a wind turbine on top, and the shaft of the wind turbine is linked to the rear wheels. The linkage is such that when the vehicle moves to the right and the wheels turn clockwise, the turbine blades rotate in a direction that tries to push the air to the left. Now, in true theoretical physics fashion, I'm going to strip away the superfluous details of Blackbird and analyze a model that gets to the heart of the counterintuitive result. First, let's imagine replacing the wind turbine, which is simply a couple of fan blades, with a cross-flow fan. So here's the cross-flow fan, and we're looking at it end-on. This is the back wheel with the axle, and the wind is blowing from left to right across the top of the fan. So this is the wind. And the fan and the wheel are linked together in such a way that when the wheel turns clockwise, the fan turns counterclockwise. And one easy way to create this linkage between the fan and the wheel is to let the fan roll along the axle of the wheel. So here's the axle, and there's the wheel itself. So here's the ground, and of course the wind blowing across the top of the fan from left to right. Now these are the main components of the vehicle that we need to analyze, but just to be complete, let me go ahead and draw the body of the vehicle, um, something like this. So now the wheel on front that rolls freely, and of course the axle of the fan and the axle of the wheel are held in place by this frame. Now what we want to do is analyze the forces on the fan and on the wheel. So let's begin with the fan. So here's the fan, and we have a force acting at the top of the fan due to the wind. I'll assume that force is to the right, so I'll label that as F sub W, the force due to the wind. And we also have a force um, at the contact point between the fan and the wheel. So let's call that F sub C, C for contact. So this contact with the wheel. Now there are other forces acting on the fan. In particular we have the gravitational force pulling it down. We have a normal force uh, due to the wheel at, uh, pushing on the fan that is in this direction up through the center of mass. 
normal force. There's also a force due to the frame acting on the axle that keeps the axle in place. I don't know which direction that force might be. Let me just draw it this way. That's the force from the frame. But you'll notice these three forces are all acting at or through the center of mass. And what we're going to do is we're going to compute the torques due to all of the forces. So those forces, the normal gravity and frame forces, don't contribute to the torque. Let's go ahead and write down the torque. And I'll use the sign convention that a counterclockwise rotation is positive. So with that convention, the contact force exerts a torque F sub C times R1, where R1 is the radius of the fan. And F sub W contributes in the negative direction a torque Fw times R1. And now we apply Newton's second law in angular form. to set the total torque acting on the fan equal to the moment of inertia of the fan. So I1 is the moment of inertia and theta1 double dot is the angular acceleration of the fan. So I'm using theta1 to denote the angle of the fan relative to some direction, say the x-axis. That's theta1. And the double dot denotes the second time derivative of that angle. So theta double dot is the angular acceleration. Now let's analyze the forces acting on the wheel. This is the wheel and this is the axle of the wheel. We have a contact force between the fan and the wheel and remember the fan rides on the axle of the wheel. So here's that contact force. And notice this force, this is the same contact force as we have up here. That's just Newton's third law that tells us that the force that the wheel exerts on the fan is equal but opposite to the force that the fan exerts on the wheel. So in addition to this contact force, we also have a force from the ground acting on the wheel. We'll call that F sub G. There's the gravitational force acting at the center of mass. There's a normal force from the ground acting up through the center of mass. And there's also a force that the frame exerts on the wheel at the axle. I don't know which direction to draw it. Let me just draw it this way. So this is from the frame. These three forces don't exert uh, any torque on the wheel. So the sum of the torques is simply, um, well, first of all, in the clockwise direction, we have F sub C times this radius, which I'm going to call R2 prime. So R2 prime is the radius of the axle. Acting in the opposite direction, we have the torque due to this ground force. And I'll call the radius of the wheel itself R2. So R2 prime is the radius of the axle. R2 is the radius of the wheel itself. And now by Newton's second law in angular form, this total torque acting on the wheel is equal to the moment of inertia of the wheel, which I'll call I2 times the angular acceleration of the wheel, which I'll call theta2, double dot. So again, theta2 here is just a measure of the angle, angular orientation of the wheel, and the double dot denotes second time derivative. Let me repeat the previous equation for the fan. We had F sub C times R1 minus F W for wind times R1 equals R1 times theta1 double dot. Of course, theta1 and theta2 are not independent. If you recall how the fan and the wheel are connected, the fan rotates on the axle of the wheel. So however much, um, however quickly points along the perimeter of the fan pass by this contact point,
the points on the perimeter of the axle have to pass by that contact point at the same rate. So that imposes the condition that R1 theta1 dot, that's the rate of passage of points along the perimeter of the fan, equals minus R2 prime times theta2 dot. So that's the radius of the axle times the angular uh, velocity of the axle. And the relative minus sign is because a positive rotation in theta1 corresponds to a negative rotation in theta2. Now the last relation we need, at least for the moment, is the equation that tells us that the wheel rolls without slipping along the ground. So let's let this be the x direction, and we'll denote by x the location of the wheel, the contact point between the wheel and the ground. So the rate at which that contact point moves, x dot, has to equal the following. If you're riding along with the vehicle watching the ground move uh, past you at a rate x dot, you need to see this wheel rotating. The perimeter of the wheel needs to be moving underneath you at the same rate. So that tells us that x dot is equal to minus r2, the radius of the wheel, times theta2 dot. And again, the minus sign because uh, positive motion in x corresponds to a clockwise or negative rotation of the wheel. And now we just need to carry out a bit of algebra. So let's first notice that theta2 dot can be written in terms of x dot as theta2 dot equals minus 1 over r2 times x dot. And then theta1 dot is equal to minus r2 prime over r1 times theta2 dot but theta2 dot is minus, so that cancels this, 1 over r2 times x dot. And now we differentiate each of these equations in time to get theta2 double dot equals minus 1 over r2 times x double dot, and theta1 double dot equals r2 prime over r1 times r2 times x dot, x double dot. Now let's use these results to eliminate the angular accelerations from our Newton's second law equations. So this gives Fc times R1 minus Fw times R1 equals I1 times theta1 double dot. That's R2 prime over R1, R2, x double dot. And the other equation was Fc times R2 prime minus Fg times R2 equals I2 times theta2 double dot, which is minus 1 over R2 times x double dot. And I see I missed a subscript 1 here for the moment of inertia of the fan. Now, in these equations, I really don't care what Fc is the contact force, so let's eliminate that. Um, let's solve each of these equations for F sub C. So in the first equation, we bring this term to the right-hand side and divide through by R1. We get Fw plus I1 times R2 prime over R1 squared times R2 x double dot. And if we solve this equation for F sub C, we get f sub g times r2 over r2 prime, because we're dividing through by r2 prime, plus, or rather minus, i2 divided by r2 times r2 prime times x double dot. Now I have an equation that relates the force that the wind exerts on the vehicle, the force that the ground exerts on the vehicle, and the acceleration of the vehicle. Now there's one other relation among these quantities that we can write down that comes from applying Newton's second law to the system as a whole. In other words, the entire vehicle. The fan, the wheel, and the supporting uh, frame. So the only external forces acting on this vehicle, of course we're ignoring friction, the only external forces are 
the wind force and the ground force. So this is the sum of all external forces acting on the entire vehicle. And that has to equal the mass of the entire vehicle, I'll just call it m, times the acceleration, which is x double dot. And now, since we really don't care about the ground force, let's uh, solve this for the ground force and use it to eliminate f sub g up here. So f sub g is equal to f sub w minus capital M times x double dot. And now this equation becomes f sub w equals, let's bring this term to the right hand side, so that's minus i1 times r2 prime over r1 squared times r2 times x double dot equals r2 over r2 prime times fg, which is fw minus m x double dot minus i2 times or divided by r2 r2 prime times x double dot. And now let's bring this term to the left hand side and combine it with f sub w. We have 1 minus r2 over r2 prime times f sub w equals, now notice the rest of the terms on the right hand side are proportional to x double dot. So that's, um, put the minus signs outside, that's minus i1 times r2 prime over r1 squared times r2 plus m times r2 over r2 prime plus i2 divided by r2 times r2 prime, all of that times x double dot. Notice this complicated factor in brackets. Each term is positive and the terms have dimensions of mass. So let's abbreviate this with the Greek letter mu. Then our equation can be written fairly simply as x double dot equals 1 over mu times, um, I'm going to bring the minus sign over here and write this factor in parentheses as r2 over r2 prime minus 1, then times f sub w. Now this is one of our main results. Recall that r2 is the radius of the wheel and r2 prime is the radius of the axle. So we're going to assume that r2 is greater than r2 prime. So this uh, ratio is bigger than 1 and the ratio minus 1 is positive. And that tells us that the acceleration will be positive In other words, x double dot will be greater than zero as long as f sub w is positive. Or in other words, as long as the force exerted by the air is in the positive direction. Now this might seem like a pretty obvious statement, but it's really not so simple. Recall that we had to assume the wheel is larger than the axle. What if it were the other way around? Let's say we had a fan and an axle and then the wheel is smaller than the axle and here's the ground. Now in this case you might want to think of this as a rail that the wheel rides along and allows the axle to extend below that level. Uh, in this case, we have r2 is less than r2 prime, so this factor is negative, and that tells us when the force due to the wind is positive, that the acceleration of the vehicle is actually negative. Another way to look at this is to recall that the net force on the system, that's the wind force minus the ground force, so this is the net force, F net equals the total mass times the acceleration. And with the acceleration given by this expression, we find that that net force is equal to m over mu times r2 over r2 prime minus 1 times fw. So if r2 is greater than r2 prime, the wheel is larger than the axle, this factor is positive, 
and a positive wind force means that the net force will be positive and the vehicle will accelerate to the right. On the other hand, if R2 is less than R2 prime, so the axle is bigger than the wheel, then a positive force, Fw, times a negative term, uh, tells it that the net force is negative and the vehicle accelerates to the left. The question that remains to be addressed is, when is the wind force positive? So here's the fan. Here are the blades on the fan. This is the wind coming in from the left. Now the wind, or the air, will produce a positive force on the vehicle as long as the velocity of the wind is greater than the velocity of the blades. Now, the velocity of the blades is the velocity relative to ground, just like the velocity of the wind is the velocity relative to the ground. So what is the velocity of the blades relative to the ground? Well, it's the speed of the vehicle, x dot, minus r1 times theta1 dot, that's the radius of the fan, times the angular velocity of the fan. And the reason it comes in with a minus sign is because, remember, counterclockwise is the positive direction of rotation. So a positive theta one dot means the fan is rotating counterclockwise and therefore the blades have a, a part of their velocity moving to the left. Now recall from before we derived the result theta one dot is equal to r2 prime divided by r1 times r2 times x dot. So combining these results we have the velocity of the wind must be greater than x1 dot minus r1 times this expression, that's r2 prime over r2 times x dot. And this, of course, simplifies to 1 minus r2 prime over r2 times x dot. So now, if r2 prime is less than r2, so that's the case in which the axle is smaller than the wheel, then this factor is positive. We can divide through by this positive factor to conclude that x dot is less than the velocity of the wind divided by 1 minus r2 prime over r2. And this is the condition for the wind force to be greater than zero. So said another way, if r2 prime is less than r2, then the maximum downwind velocity is equal to the velocity of the wind divided by 1 minus r2 prime over r2. And since the denominator is smaller than 1, this is larger than the wind speed. Now, one of the interesting consequences of this result is that you can make r2 prime just slightly smaller than r2, in which case the denominator here is close to zero and the maximum downwind velocity is very, very large. But what happens in that case is then r2 over r2 prime is just slightly larger than one, so this factor is just slightly larger than zero. So the net force acting on the vehicle is close to zero in that case. So it would take a really, really long time to, to reach that maximum velocity. Of course, you can also ask what happens if r2 prime is equal to r2. In that case, the right-hand side is zero and the net force is zero. Finally, let's look at the case where r2 prime is greater than r2. That's the case in which the axle is actually larger than the wheel. So going back to our expression for the velocity of the wind, relating it to the velocity of the vehicle, this factor in parenthesis is negative. So when we divide through by that negative quantity, we need to flip the direction of the inequality. So we find that V wind divided by 1 minus R2 prime over R2 is less than x dot.
Now this quantity on the left hand side is negative. So what this is telling us is that the maximum upwind speed or velocity is given by V wind, the negative of this, divided by R2 prime divided by R2 minus 1. And this applies to the case in which R2 prime is greater than R2. So far I've only considered the cases in which the wind force is positive, but you can carry out a similar analysis for the case in which the wind force is negative. Let me summarize the results here. Um, first of all, if the speed of the vehicle is between minus infinity and the wind velocity divided by 1 minus R2 prime over R2, then the acceleration will be positive. And if the velocity is between the wind speed divided by 1 minus R2 prime over R2 and positive infinity, then the acceleration will be negative. So first of, consider the case in which R2 prime is less than R2. Uh, in that case, the denominator is positive. So this is a positive number. So for any velocity that's negative or positive up to this maximum, the acceleration will be positive. So the wind will try to accelerate the vehicle up to this speed, this maximum speed. And if the velocity is greater than that maximum speed, then the acceleration is negative. So it slows down until it reaches that maximum speed. Now the other cases in which R2 prime is greater than R2, in that case the denominator is negative. This whole term here is negative. So that tells us that for, um, ne for velocities that are negative um, between this negative value and minus infinity, the acceleration is positive. So in this case, the vehicle is going upwind but is slowing down. And if the velocity is between this negative number and plus infinity, um, then the acceleration will be negative. So in particular, between this negative number and zero, the vehicle is traveling upwind and increasing its upwind speed. Of course, these maximum downwind and upwind velocities will never be reached in practice due to friction and inefficiencies in the wind turbine, but these issues can be minimized with clever engineering and technology. In fact, Blackbird has achieved downwind speeds of almost three times the speed of the wind and upwind speeds of about two times wind speed. It would be interesting to know what gear ratios were used for their tests. So there you have it, a systematic analysis of a simple model of a wind-powered vehicle. The analysis shows very clearly that, from a fundamental physics point of view, wind-powered vehicles can travel both downwind and upwind at speeds greater than the speed of the wind.